Yeah, it does. Yeah. I, <laughs> that one was up there, so grab that. It's just a Oh.
Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You need him, you need him to be led. Okay? That's pretty much where we're starting tonight, and then we're just diving in. So, with that, God, we just thank you for this night. We just thank you for this Bible study. Lord, like I prayed last week, you gave me this huge revelation that changed in just kind of reshaped the way I look at things, God. I just pray that you can give me the words that I could be led by you properly to properly give this revelation to the church. Lord, I just thank you that you loved all of us enough to call us to yourself, that you call everyone to yourself as long as we turn to you. God, I just thank you for giving you, for you giving us your very own spirit to help guide us. Lord, I just pray that you just help give me the words t tonight to properly deliver this and to glorify you. Say this in your mighty name, amen. All right, guys. So like I said, starting out with we need God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I hit the Holy Spirit pretty hard last week. So many scriptures on... So, going into tonight, uh, one last thing of recap, uh, the spiritual dehydration. It is still having God in your life, but not having his power, his authority, his peace, his love. It's like having God in your life, but not his Holy Spirit, or not. What I said last week, that was my own definition not anybody else's definition, that's mine. So, going from there, night two, um, we're going to spend quite a bit of tonight looking at actual... have it in your house, you can buy it at the grocery store, you can go to a spigot outside, I mean, it's pretty much readily available everywhere. And it's all drinkable, for the most part. So, a couple different studies said a couple different things, but the main one I found is that three out of four Americans suffer from some type of dehydration, whether that's minor or major. Um, now, minor could literally be, you know, you needed a few more ounces today to be perfectly hydrated. But we're going to see here pretty soon for quite a few that's not the case. Um, so that's 75% of Americans are not fully or completely hydrated. So is it not knowing that they need more water? Is it not caring? Is it being too busy? Is it, because those were some of the uh, leading um, answers I found, was either not knowing, um, living a life of being perpetually dehydrated so your body kind of gets used to not having enough water, so it functions perfectly fine without enough water. Um, a lot of people said that they're too busy. Um, that's why we have apps out there that literally sing or do like the water pouring sound like every hour or every hour and a half or something to remind you, oh yeah, I'm supposed to drink some water. I should probably do that so that I stay hydrated. Or the not caring. I mean, honestly, <laughs> we... <laughs> At the kids building, I can be like, hey guys, we're going on a hike today. Everyone grab your water. We're getting on the bus. Does everyone have their water? 
Yeah. We get off the bus. Does everyone have their water? Oh, I left my water at home. Oh, I left it in. loop here and uh, you're not going to have any water when it's like 90 degrees out. To me that's not caring. That is not being prepared enough to and that's even with somebody sitting there pushing them. Hey we need this. We need this. We need this. It's weird when you think about these things. You know these physical pictures and then you compare it to spiritual reality. Just saying. Okay so um, so one of the most common things to show you you're dehydrated, that you're already dehydrated, not that you're becoming dehydrated, but that you already are dehydrated, is that you feel thirsty. I mean, that's, that's a pretty common one. Or my favorite that like triggers me to show me I'm thirsty, when I like see somebody like, ah. and then I'm like, Seeing them drink some water, I'm, I'm actually kind of thirsty. That, that triggers me anyway. <clears throat> but knowing that you're actually thirsty, your body telling you, hey, I'm thirsty, I need water. It's one of the biggest things, one of the biggest triggers that we can actually pinpoint and say, this, now you're dehydrated. Because at that point, you're already there. So, at that level of dehydration, to where you're actually already thirsty, it isn't the very beginning stages, it's about halfway through dehydration. It's your body literally panicking, saying, I need water. And this could come after, you know, being outside on a hot day, or um, exercising, or having a full day of not drinking water, and then it just kind of hits you. Um, even like battling sicknesses and stuff like that, you're supposed to drink more fluids. So it can get to that level pretty quick. So even though it sounds kind of weird, staying hydrated actually takes a bit of focus. And I, I know that sounds weird. Like even like writing it, I was like, well, that's kind of weird, but it, it's true. Unless you like have one of those water bottles, which I think is really cool and it's like the huge ones and it's like, by this time you should drink this and this time you should drink this. and those are really cool because they kind of give you a guide throughout your day to show you whether you're being hydrated or you're not being hydrated. So my biggest thing is, so right now, physically, not spiritually, physically, are you thirsty? Do you feel dehydrated? Right now as I'm talking about it, do you feel like your <laughs> mouth like, man, I, I, I might be a little bit thirsty right now. It's weird when somebody brings it to you and asks you the question that it triggers in your mind. You go, oh yeah, maybe actually. How weird would it be if we had people on Sunday just like walking around? Are you spiritually hydrated today? Come on. Then get, get, you, get you stopping and thinking. You're like, man, maybe I do need a little bit more hydration. <laughs> Maybe I should have uh, worshipped a little harder. I mean, you know, so um, back to the notes here. So about an estimated 42,000 people die every week related to some diseases related to not having adequate water or not having enough water. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people who don't have water when literally at the kids' building, we have kids like dumping water on each other, or just spraying it on the ground. I mean, we're wasting a lot of water. Remember these. These, these notes tie in later, too, so you guys know. Um, so there is 2.6 billion people in the world without proper, sorry, properly sanitized water. That's a lot of people. They do have some form of sanitized water, but not 100% properly sanitized water. That's a lot of people suffering. Like, 
Like I said last week, I don't know about you guys, but if I do not drink a ton of water a day, it like drastically affects me. Like it will give me a migraine and I will be down and out for the rest of the day. Like the only way I can get rid of the migraine So for me, if I lived in one of those places, I, I would be suffering daily or my body would just adapt, I guess. I don't know. But do we want to adapt so we're okay with being dehydrated? Like I said, this whole night is physical and spiritual picture. So we're okay not being properly spiritually hydrated. It's kind of a weird place to be. Um, so also being dehydrated, some of the other uh, side effects, if you want to call them that. Feeling thirsty, lightheaded, dry mouth, tiredness, having dark colored urine, not passing urine as often, having headaches, migraines, and it can keep going on and on depending on how dehydrated you actually are. Because the more dehydrated you are, the worse these side effects get. Makes sense, right? Okay. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 43% of adults drink less than four cups of water a day. That blew my mind. That doesn't even make sense to me. Like this right here is more than four cups of water and I blow through this like before 10 a.m. So to only drink that during a day is kind of crazy. And I mean, this study came from 2015. So now I see a lot of people carrying water bottles, so it could have changed a little bit. Um, but of that, um, let's see, of that 43%, 36% drink one to three cups of water a day. That's like nothing. And 7% said that they drink none. They drink no water. That they do not count water from soda or coffee. I know some people that's like, I've already drank a lot of water today because I put down three cups of coffee. That is not drinking water. That is drinking coffee. And that will dehydrate you even more. So when we are drinking things other than water, once again, Spiritual, physical here. Once we're drinking things other than water, it's going to dehydrate us even more. It's going to make us even more thirsty, even more dehydrated. Um, so to stay properly hydrated, I found three different ones um, that told me how much water to actually drink. The first thing, it said uh, 15 to 13 cups of water a day, which... Okay, I, I can track with that. I'm, I'm good with that. The other one said uh, the rule was eight by eight. Drink eight, eight ounces cups of water a day. Okay. Um, the other one that was heavily listed was take your body weight, divide it in half, and that's how many ounces of water you should drink. All these random things. <laughs> As I'm teaching, I hear somebody filling up water. I know, so thirsty. <laughs> so, so are we dehydrated? Spiritually and physically. Are you dehydrated? Because there's times throughout the day where you can be both, or you could be perfectly hydrated both ways. I know today I had an extra cup of coffee, so I am like extra thirsty. I like went home and my water bottle was empty and I had to fill it up and I just started like downing my water bottle because I was even more thirsty than usual. So once again, spiritual dehydration. <clears throat> Having God in your life, it's not, it's not saying that you don't have God in your life. It is just saying that you do not have those things that go with God, the power and the authority 
and the love and the peace and the kindness, all of those things that come with God, that you're lacking those. Um, so like I said, at the Bridge Kids, we have, uh, actually, I think that was before Bible study. So at the Bridge Kids, we have our random definition for a parable is a physical teaching on something that is spiritual. So every time Jesus will show these people something physical and it applies perfectly spiritual. <clears throat> That's pretty much what tonight it is. It is showing us physically how being dehydrated affects you as a person and affects your body. It affects inwardly and outwardly. So looking at that same thing now spiritually, how does it affect us inwardly and outwardly? Because uh, last week we, we talked about, well, I talked about, you guys were pretty quiet. But last week I talked about um, how the song Highlands, Song of Ascent, just really, God was just showing me. And, and the main message from that to me was he's not that hard to find. He's literally in us. He works in and through us. He guides us. He's all around us because that's who God is. So now starting to look at this spiritually, if he's just that not, not if he's just not that hard to find, then why don't we do it? Why don't we ask for more of him in our life? Why don't we read more? Why don't we pray more? Why do we not go out and step outside of our comfort zone and do the things that he's called us to do? And maybe you are doing all of those things. Then now, instead of inwardly, praying for myself, reading for myself. Are we doing those things for others as well? The outwardly. I'm going to, and I mean, you don't have to sit there and make it a point, and I'm reading my Bible today for this person. No, but if you pray and you're like, God, can you show me something in your word that I can help this person? They're going through a hard time. They're going through this or that. God, can you, can you help Open your word to me so that I can help them. So that I can be that reflection of your image. So as Christians, we, we see the same exact excuses for actual dehydration with spiritual dehydration. I'm too busy. Man, for the last quite a few years, I've told myself I am too busy, and then more things just keep happening. I'm like, I'm doing this and this and this. I, I am super busy. And then God's like, really? Here, here's one more thing. And then you're like, oh, now I'm doing this, 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 and this. Now I'm really too busy. And then God's like, and here's a child. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, now we're doing all of these things. To where I've got to the point now to where I'm like, I'm never too busy for anything. Like, you know, it's like one of those things, it's like you don't ask like, oh, what else bad can happen? Like, it's one of those things, like, I'm not going to say I'm too busy for anything anymore. Because you know what? In every stage of that, God has been so faithful to help me do everything that is needed and more. That God has been so faithful that I actually don't need to worry about how busy I am because he makes a way. That was almost one of my excuses for not even coming to pastor with these Bible studies was I'm too busy. Like we're doing the bridge kids every day from morning to late afternoon. We, you know, I still have curriculum to write for the summer. I still have curriculum to write for the entire school year. We're going on a camping trip. I mean, I'm too busy. And then God reminded me, you're never too busy. You're never too busy. Are we too busy for God and to do what God asks us to do? If that answer is yes, we need to dive in deeper to God. If I tell God no because I'm too busy, 
then yeah, you are going to struggle with those things. You are going to struggle with your time management. You are going to struggle with everything that God has for you because you're not actually being led by him at that point. Even though I was telling myself I'm too busy, God has made ample time for me to work on this and still not drop any or neglect any of my other responsibilities. And God has fully made a way. I mean, he's even blessed me with my little one taking like extra long naps so I can work on Bible study. Praise Jesus. <laughs> but what are some of the excuses we give other than I'm too busy that wouldn't apply to actually being too dehydrated? I don't deserve it. I don't deserve this much of God's presence. You don't know what I've done. I've done too many bad things. I don't deserve God to work through me like this. I mean, because sometimes that thought creeps into my mind. I don't know about you guys, but that, that does creep into my mind. And many other thoughts as well of I'm not deserving or I shouldn't be doing this or but then God shuts that down I bring those things to him I don't sit there and dwell on them like sitting in a corner with like a blanket just oh God I don't even deserve this when I have those thoughts I bring them to God and I say God do I deserve this when he asked me to take over the kids program, I struggled with that. God, do I deserve to even step up to teach these kids? You know who I am. And time after time, he would just speak into me through others, through his word, through praying, and encourage me. Did the whole thing, you know, Moses did. Well, God, I don't know. It just reminded me of a note I wrote down, and I didn't even put it in my notes. Um, so as Moses, or as we, as people, are sitting there telling God that we can't do something that he's called us to, once we're telling God, God has called you to do something, he says, go from here to here, whatever that here to here is, whether that's teaching, preaching, reaching out and talking to somebody, praying for somebody, giving, whatever it may be. And we tell God we can't because. Have you guys ever like just sat there and just talked and gave speeches or been up here and preached or te taught or anything or just talked to somebody for an extended period of time and you keep talking and talking and talking. Next thing you know, your mouth is so dried out. It's hard to talk. It's what we're doing to God. We're sitting there telling God, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And we're becoming more and more dehydrated. Every moment we're telling God that we can't do it, even though he's literally called you to do it. Even though he personally, there's so many people in this world, and he was like, you know who would be perfect for that job? You. You. You're the perfect one to go. And then you're like, well, that's cool you think that, but uh, I'm good. Uh, I can't. Uh, I'm busy. Uh, actually, I want to do something else. We're sitting there telling God all of these excuses, and we're becoming more and more dehydrated because we're trying to pull away from what he wants. Another super basic definition of sin is just if God call, whatever is outside of God's will whatever is outside of God so if God is telling me go here and I'm like no I can't I can't I can't I can't I can't we're pulling literally further and further away from God so of course we're going to be dehydrated because we're pulling away from the source of water, so of course we're becoming more dehydrated of him. 
It's once we stop and we come back into alignment is where he really just starts to press in or where we start to press in and he starts to reward that. Back to what I was saying before that. So we have all of these random excuses that we give God. I don't know what all your guys' are, but I know what mine are. And I have to stop and actually think sometimes that sometimes my mind will dwell on something and be like, I don't know because of this. I don't know. There are times I literally have to stop what I am doing and not even pray, but just speak out that Jesus Christ paid the price. Like, why am I fretting about this or about that when God himself came down, died an extremely vicious death, just so I have a chance to get to know the Father, just so I have that chance, if I want to or not. That's the kind of God he is. That is still so mind-blowing to me. So like I said, sometimes, yeah, those thoughts do creep into my mind. You know, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But it's what you do with those thoughts. Do you let them fester? Do you let them draw you away from God? Do you let them literally suck the hydration out of you? Or do you take that moment to actually press into God and get rehydrated as this thing's trying to pull you away? Because something that I always tell the kids is, yes, God would love if you came to church. Because that's, that's the thing they always go to. Well, you can't be Christian if you don't go to church. And I'm like, don't get me wrong. Going to church helps a lot. But what he wants even more than that is you. He wants your heart. He wants your love. He wants you to love him. Because no matter what, he's always going to have that love coming towards you. But once we start accepting that love, and actually start loving him back, that is where we see God move mountains. That's where we see God move in our life in ways that we literally thought were impossible. We got in a discussion today, and they were just asking question after question of, but is it possible if God could? Do you think God would be able to? And I had to stop, like I let it go for a few moments and then I had to stop and I'm like, well, do I think all of these things are possible for God to do? He spoke everything into existence. So I think the rest of it's kind of a piece of cake. I think the rest of it's kind of easy as long as we're allowing him to. I mean, now if you're sitting here, not pressing into him, not even looking towards him for any help, is it possible he can still miraculously heal that situation? Definitely. Or is it more likely that he's going to heal that situation when you're actually asking him to? I mean, either way is possible. Like I said, he is literally God of the impossible. He, he does things that we can't even fathom or comprehend. But is it more likely for God to fully step into your situation and help you after knowing about him. Um, so actually, we're going to jump all the way to 1 Thessalonians 5.14. <clears throat> um, and we're going to go all the way to 22. We earnestly urge you, believers, admonish those things who are out of line, the disciplined, the unruly, the disorderly. Encourage the timid who lack spiritual courage. 
Help the spiritually weak. Be patient with everyone, always controlling your temper. I mean, we could almost stop there. <laughs> I mean, those things are so crucial to correct those who are out of line, to encourage those who, are, who lack the courage, or to help those who are spiritually weak. I mean, there's the, there's the big one right there. Always controlling your temper. It's so easy to fly off the handle. For some people, other people, it's really hard. But for a lot of people I know, it's pretty easy to do that. Um, picking up in 15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek that which is good for one another for all people. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer in every situation, no matter the circumstances. Be thankful and continually give thanks to God. For this is the will of God for you in Jesus Christ. Okay, so rejoice no matter what. Be unending in prayer in every situation. Be thankful. Pretty good start there. Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the workings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. To me, it's like when people say quench, I always picture like a flame, like a birthday candle. And you see the person like lick their fingers and like pssst, and fully put it out. That's kind of how I picture quenching the Holy Spirit. The fire is just going and then you're just like, yeah, I'm all right. But then don't subdue it. Don't be unresponsive to it. So it's not even just you physically licking your fingers and sitting there putting it out, but it could be you neglecting it and letting it be put out. Do not scorn or reject gifts or prophecy or prophecies spoken revelation, words of instruction, or exhortation, or warning. But test all things carefully, so you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Withdraw and keep away from it. So when we're rejoicing always, when we're always in prayer and being thankful, not rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit, and holding on to what is good, sounds like it's pretty impossible to quench the spirit at that point. But that, what a Christian life should entail. It makes it sound, I don't know, I used to think it was like really hard to quench the spirit. It's like, well, just don't stop doing what you're doing. But that's not it. It's, you have to, like I said earlier, it takes a lot of focus to keep hydrated. Sometimes you have to set reminders to pray for somebody. I know that I'm really terrible with time, so if like somebody has like a big job interview or going in for surgery or something, like I physically have to go on my phone and set a reminder for that time to pray. Not saying that that's the only time that you should be like, well, they only got this like two minute window. I'll say, God, watch over them. Amen. That's not it. That's not it. You, like it says, always be praying. We always got things to pray about. How often do we tell ourselves we don't? I mean, if everything in your life is so perfect that you have nothing to pray about, that's something to pray about. Thank God for that. I mean, if you have nothing going on to where your life is good to go, or your friends' lives, or your family's lives, or your neighbors' lives are all for some, I don't know, miracle, all of those are going phenomenally perfect, then are we praying and thanking God even for that? We always got something to pray about, always. But I like the abstaining from every evil. And then it even gives a side note, withdraw and keep away from it. 
Sometimes we give the excuse of, well, I'm helping that person out of their sin, so I could step in it. Oh, I'm... This one kind of irritates me. I'm ministering to the people at the bar. There's not a reason you should have a tab that large. Uh, You know, if God called you there, I don't think he made it okay for you to do that. But anyway, um, so there's certain things, but no, pull away from evil. That doesn't mean pull away from anyone who ever does evil. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus didn't recluse into some cave out in the mountains by himself. No, but it, keep away from doing those things. Keep away from, if you have an issue with a certain sin, keep away from it. Like, don't sit there and try to tell yourself, well, I'm going to test myself and see how well I do. Don't do that. I have quite a few people ask, well, is it bad for Christians to watch this? Is it bad for Christians to listen to this? Is it bad for Christians to go here? I usually start by saying, if you're asking me, there's a reason you're asking. Is there something in you that tells you it's not okay? But beyond that, is it going to tempt you and pull you away from God? Is it going to distract you from God? Is it going to put thoughts and ideas in your head that should not be there? That's a pretty good, like, guardrail right there, right, to make sure you don't fly off. Those those are basic, basic questions. That's a pretty good guardrail. But I always come back to, well, what is God telling you? I mean, if you come and ask me, should I be listening to this? And nobody's called you out on it. I'm going to guess the answer is probably no. If you're questioning watching something and you're like, should I really be watching this? I'm going to try to make it okay. I'm going to come ask Logan. Logan, do you think it's okay? My answer is probably going to be a no. But I mean, that's between you and God. I'm not going to step in and try to be God in your life. That is your responsibility. I will help guide. But that's your responsibility. So, overall as the world, we're pretty thirsty for God. We need more of God. We need more of His Spirit flowing in and through us. Um, I mean, we hear uh, Pastor or Brady talk about, you know, these revivals and, and that a lot of people, a lot of Christians look towards those and they go, oh, those were amazing. But it starts inside of you. It starts with that little fire that you can help build up and you can help build. Not that it's your fire to fully build. No, and that's God's. But you can help tend the fire to help it improve. You can help God work more in your life so that that huge revival is happening inside of you. But it's your, it's yours to tend. What are we going to do with it? So, as the world we're lacking, the Holy Spirit. Uh, And like I said with talking about thirst, actual dehydration, do we know it? Have we gotten to a point in Christianity where I've only taken, you know, a cup of water a day? So my body has then made it okay that that's okay. I'm okay only having a cup a day. I would die. Literally. <laughs> not, not spiritually. Spiritually too, but literally. But if we got to that point where we're now okay with such little amounts of God in our life, we're happy with those little amounts of God in our life, are we truly doing and living what God has called us to? 
Or is God speaking to us? Or is God revealing anything to you? Some people have asked me, well, God doesn't speak to me. God doesn't reveal things to me. God doesn't. How hard are we trying? Because if you sit there and you listen to music that is not godly, you watch things that aren't godly, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, and you're wondering how come God isn't speaking to you, are you giving him a chance to? Are we even allowing God to speak to us? Because he's not, in most cases, he's not just going to sit there and call down, Logan, as I'm like doing all my things, and I'm like, oh, oh, hold on, God. Let me turn off my Pandora. Let me shut off my movie. Yes, God. That's not it. When we are doing the things he's called us to, he's going to speak into us more. When we are reading and seeking and praying and worshiping is a huge one for me that sometimes gets left out. People are like, read and pray, which, not knocking, is amazing and everybody needs to do it more. But to me, also worshiping. That is my time where God pours so much into me. And I'm going to give you a side note. He pours so much into me after I've prayed and read. It's not just I only listen to worship and that's the only way God speaks to me. No, no, no. He speaks to me after I really try to get to know him, get to see the situation he's pointing out to me, really get to hear what he's speaking out to me. So as a church, I think it's a very scary place when you realize that you've only been taking the smallest sips of water and you're okay with it. Or you're drinking other things and trying to substitute it as water. Oh, but I listened to this pastor. Oh, I listened to this kind of secular, kind of Christian music and I was worshiping. Are you drinking water? Are you drinking soda? Are you drinking water? Are you drinking coffee? What are you putting in your body other than water when it should be water? Spiritually. What are we allowing to come in and we're calling it water? Well, it should count as water. So earlier I said a lot of people were dying from water. Anybody remember the number? 40,000 a week. 42,000. Super close. <clears throat> so 42,000 people a week are dying because of unclean water. If we look at that spiritually, how many people are dying spiritually because of unclean water? People that are pouring out things. I mean, I'm being really modest with saying soda and coffee, but what about the people who, out there who are producing sewage, calling it water? Really destroying and derailing people. This is why we have to read. This is why we have to pray. So we know what is truth. So we know what is clean water and what we know what is not clean water. So before we put something in our body, let's stop and actually take a moment. Before we put something in our mind, in our hearts, in our spirits, we need to realize if it is good or if it is not good, if it is clean or if it is dirty. Because just because I intake something that is dirty doesn't mean it's instantly going to kill me. But what if I spill that out to somebody else and they take that as truth, they take that as the gospel message? I just fully derailed that person. And that is fully my fault at that point because I didn't know whether if it was clean or dirty before I took that cup and handed it off to somebody else. So we're going to go ahead and look at some of the similarities between dehydration and spiritual hydration, uh, dehydration, sorry. So, <clears throat> uh, so for actual hydration, we need water in our body for, the, for cells to function properly. 
for the, all of the cells in our body to actually function properly, we need water. And I mean, I am going to read the physical and spiritual sides of these, but I mean, play with it in your mind for a minute. So if you are not spiritually hydrated as a church, as a body, is our body functioning properly? Are we doing the things that we should or are we not? Or are we trying to, I don't know, run through sand instead of just gliding? It helps regulate your temperature. I mean, that's pretty obvious with Revelation, right? You cold, you lukewarm, or you hot? You're going to be spewed out? It's a terrifying verse. For all those people drinking something other than water, that's, that's terrifying. As someone who God gave me salvation, it's terrifying because I want to go out and help those people and find those people. And that's not just because I'm Logan, because I'm up here on Thursday. That is because I'm a Christian and I have true salvation. It helps break down food. <clears throat> helps us understand God's word. How are you going to logically, in your own mind, sit there and read the Bible and make sense of all of that? Honestly, if you try to do it without God's help, it sounds like a fairy tale. I mean, some of those stories... They sound, they sound made up. But I know God, and every single one of those stories are true. Every single one of those stories were for then and now. Every one of those stories teach us something, or in most cases, a whole lot of somethings. Not just one thing. That's how God can use the same Bible to teach us millions upon millions of different things using the same story to teach you 40 things, and you're like, whoa, God's awesome. Um, so water helps transport nutrients to cells. It helps work through us to help each other. What does the Bible say? If you have enough for yourself and there's somebody in need, help them. Now, I'm not saying, you know, take the last penny you have to go help somebody, but if you have extra food and you see somebody literally sitting there starving, pat them on the back. Hopefully you get food tomorrow, bud. It's not Christ-like at all. Um, and it aids in removing waste from the body. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Helps us work through our sin. It helps us work through all the junk that we built up in our life all the falseness, all the fake things, all of the bad things, and it helps wade through all of those for me to have a better relationship with God. <clears throat> so in Matthew 7 is where we're going next. <clears throat> and we're going to start in verse 7, and it says, it's Jesus talking, and he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. This is given three different descriptions of, it is, I love it, because I'm such a visual person, so I love when Jesus gives us these pictures that is just, literally, if you are a kid going to your parents' door and you're knocking on it, they're going to open it up for you. If you ask your parent for something and you truly need it, they'll make sure you have it, whether there's money in the bank or not. Whether it's easy or not, they're going to get it for you. So... My question is, is, so are we still willing to be dehydrated? Because if it's an issue of not knowing, of n not knowing I need more water, if it's an issue of not knowing whether I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life or not, 
like I said, I'm like I said last week, I'm not here to offend anybody, but I look at the state of the church, not our church, but the church. We need so much more of the Holy Spirit. I went to a uh, a banquet dinner, man, that was like three months ago now. And it was a it was a charity event. They were it was a company thanking all of these um, people for donating to these charities. And at first, I'm like, man, this is so amazing. This is awesome. And then at the end of the night, they had people from each organization, one person who was deeply affected by them, stand up and give their own testimony of this charity. Now, precursor here, I am not knocking any of these charities. They have done amazing things. But when there is a man who stands, actually, he didn't stand. He was paralyzed. He wheeled up in front of everybody, and he says his name. He was hit by a drunk driver, um, lost the function of his legs, ends up getting divorced because of this, ends up losing um, custody of his children, is literally living on somebody's couch, a family member's couch. And then finally somebody gave him the number to this charity organization and they helped him get a wheelchair because he didn't even have that. They helped him get the proper help for physical therapy. They helped him um, get the proper things installed at the house. That way he was able to wheel into the house properly. And like I said, this charity is amazing and they, it's so amazing that they did these things. But where is the church in these things? It, every story I heard, I would literally thank God for this company. And then I'm like, but where is the church? Like we are supposed to be the ones shining God's love to these people who are hurt, who are broken. <clears throat> and yet these people who are non-Christians step up and do God's work, but without God. I mean, there were so many stories. There was <clears throat> this, just so many. Um, this lady who, another one that really spoke to me was this lady who had been on and off the streets, addicted for many years to many different drugs. And finally she got cleaned up and they gave her a job. This charity gave her a job and her job was just to stand at the front desk and talk with people. After she went through their course of getting clean and sober, after meeting with their counselors, after meeting with all their people and being clean for a few months, they gave her this job. And I'm like, where is the church helping these people? Like, it is very good that she got off the streets and is no longer addicted. And no longer living that lifestyle. It is very good. Like I said, I'm not knocking any of these charities. How much better would it be with Christ? Every one of these stories was a story of an issue, a period of depression, of hardship of money, of hardship of food, quality of life, and then a charity stepped in and helped them. My question that I got irritated with was where are the Christians? It actually frustrated me by the end of the night. Because there are a lot of churches in this area. Quite a few of them do ministry outward. But how much could we really be doing? How much more can we be doing if we had more churches listening and being led by the Holy Spirit? If we had more churches, instead of trying to get a big old bank account, actually putting it towards ministry? 
how many more things in God's name, not the name of this charity or that charity, but in God's name could be fixed. So how much Holy Spirit can we live with? A sip? A drop? A gallon? A source of never-ending that pours out of you? I mean, Jesus said we can have that. I mean, if Jesus said we can have it, I kind of believe him. So, I don't know. I think we should shoot for that as Christians. I think we should, that should be what we are aiming for. Like, it's good and amazing that the Holy Spirit is starting to work through you in these issues that we have. But how much more amazing could it be when he's working in and through us to pour out to others? I mean, it was such a revelation that when I, when I first discovered that, yes, the Holy Spirit is for me, yes. But no, it's not just for me. It's not for me to have God come into my body and start to clean all these things out, and that's it. Like, that's a good starting point, definitely. But when, you, when we get that revelation where he comes in and he clears the things out, now we do have that clean water pouring out of us. Now we do have that source of never-ending water pouring out of us that is not just for me, but for literally anybody around me especially those who God is directing you to. Got way off my notes, and now it's almost been an hour, and I still got like two pages of notes. So, so I'll go ahead and uh, start to wrap it up right here. Because I told you guys last week that we would even jump into spiritual hydration, but didn't make it quite that far. But this revelation is also not just a revelation, it's a call. It's, a, it's me urging you. It's God urging you. Do the things he's guiding you to do. Don't be afraid. Don't be disheartened when, when we think about it. I mean, it always reminds me of the, uh, the guy who came up to Jesus and was like, so what do I need to do to get into heaven? He's like, obey the commands. And he's like, done that. Now what? And he says, give up all of your money and follow me. And he walks away sad. Because he's unwilling to follow. But this is mine. You don't get that, Jesus. This is mine. I believe we're called to be a servant of Christ. We're called to honor, worship, and praise God. We're called so that Jesus can be our Lord and Savior. Not so that I can have all of this and maybe do what Jesus wants. I think I'll go ahead and end it there, guys. God, I just thank you for tonight. I just thank you for <clears throat> the things that you've shown me and that you've put in me that that like in Timothy it's, it's that fire that just continues to be fanned and not just in me Lord but in others Lord even right now I'm picturing a little wildfire that, that starts with a little ember a little flick that happened and especially in this area we see wildfires and they just go and they just start to ignite and they just burn up everything. They burn up. God, I pray for that. I pray for all of the stuff in our lives that don't matter, all of the things that are against you, 
scripture we read last week is the things that are actively against you. I pray that those things get burnt up in the name of Jesus, that <clears throat> it's not a question of should I or shouldn't I follow Jesus? Should I or shouldn't I be guided by the Spirit? But in your word, it says, if you love me, you'll do what I command. God, you've commanded us to do so much. And as the church in the world, we do so little. That you've commanded us to love you and put nothing else before you. And a lot of people try to put things before you and just barely fit you in. Lord, I pray against that right now. I just, it is so wrong. Like we read last week, I want to be pulled in by the Spirit so I can have sonship, so that I can be your son. So that on the day that ends, I won't try to walk into heaven and you tell me you don't know me. Lord, help me be guided by you. Help this church be fully guided by you in a way that we've never seen before. God, help us be so loyal to you that we'll, we're willing to forsake other things, other things that we count as value that are really worthless. those things that we're hiding away as keepsakes of our sin. Lord, burn it up. Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for this Bible study, not, not just for the church, but for me. God, I just thank you for being so good and amazing, seeking after us every turn in our life. You're there waiting for us. Jesus, I thank you for choosing us. Choosing a people who constantly choose other things. Lord, I pray you help shift our mind, our hearts fully towards you. So that we count the things of the world as nothing. We thank you and we love you. And we say this in your mighty name, amen.